Welcome back to another edition of the Heart to Heart podcast. And my guest today is Aaron Gunn. Aaron is a filmmaker and social commentator. You may have heard of his recent film, Canada is Dying. Aaron, welcome to the show. It's great to be here and thanks so much for having me, Mike. Yeah, I'm super excited to talk to you today. Uh, I've seen your your documentary. It was was absolutely fantastic. Uh, But just before we get into it, can you give the audience a little bit of a brief background about yourself? Yeah, I'm from uh, British Columbia, Vancouver Island, British Columbia, originally from Victoria, the capital, and then recently moved up to Campbell River, which is about a two and a half hour drive north. Um, got into, uh, I was always interested in politics and history. Uh, first job at university is with the Can- a group called the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, which was all about fighting for lower taxes and smaller government. And uh, after I left that, I got dragged into... Uh, at the time, it was just supposed to be on the side of some short videos for a group called Canada Proud, which is part of, it's a big Facebook page, a social media kind of conglomerate. And uh, those videos took off. I spun that off into my own brand. And after kind of accumulating a pretty decent following, decided I wanted to do more in-depth and investigative journalism and, and really filmmaking and uh, started doing documentaries about two or three years ago. Okay, awesome. And so the documentary that you've done recently, Canada is Dying, like what kind of propelled you to look into that and to make that documentary? Like what did you see and what were you concerned about? I think the big thing for me when it came to Canada is Dying is it was very frustrating to watch when it came to issues surrounding violent crime, homelessness, uh, open air drug use, uh, uh, addiction, opioid deaths that from our media and politicians at the time, uh, basically all their answers were, we're doing a great job. The reason why we're having these problems is we haven't gone far enough uh, when it came to the so-called kind of ideology of harm reduction, uh, whether that's building, uh, you know, safe injection sites on every block or so-called safe injection sites or up to and including just handing out these uh, free drugs. And, um, I looked around to someone growing up in BC, which is kind of the epicenter of this crisis. And, you know, I've, I've got two eyes on my, on my uh, <laughs> front of my face. And it's pretty obvious that things have been getting worse over the past 10, 15 years, not better. And thought I'd start asking some hard questions about uh, why that outcome seems to, seems to be so um, separate from what we were hearing in the mainstream news. So that's why I wanted to investigate and, and see if I could connect the dots and pull the curtain back on what was actually going on. And when you said, you know, you saw things getting worse, what was that specifically? Was it more homelessness? Was it more needles on the street? What was it uh, specifically that you were referring to? It was homelessness. It was uh, needles on the street, as you said. It was also uh, what one might call just kind of cha- chaotic street behavior. Uh, there was more conversations with friends, especially uh, females who were no longer comfortable uh, walking downtown uh, alone, whether in Victoria, especially in Vancouver, also other cities like Nanaimo and up here in Campbell River. Random acts of violence or stranger violence people are... are Random acts of violence and just also like, I mean, you'd be walking downtown Granville Street and in the like, you know, nine in the morning or something and you just have people having complete episodes and everybody's just kind of like has their head down and and trying to get to where they're going like a mental health like a psychotic break episode is that what you mean yeah yeah or some kind of drug-induced psychosis or, or something like that but it um it was a significant increase in all of these different things and then of course obviously the the overdose deaths i mean shocking numbers of in british columbia a province of just five million people we had two thousand healthy individuals mainly mainly young men dying from opioid uh, overdoses every single year. And I mean, shocking numbers. And um, yet you talk to the public health officials and all they wanted to push was was basically the same policies we've been trying in 20 years, but their argument being, we just haven't gone far enough. So um, it's, uh, it, it's something that wasn't adding up to me. It was an equation that didn't add up. And uh, so I wanted to look more into it and, and see if what, yeah, what other countries around the world were doing and um and what we might be getting wrong and you just mentioned then kind of something interesting you with regards to the opioid deaths you kind of said mostly young men do you see that group being the most affected by what you're discussing 
like with regards to homelessness, everything, like, do you find that it's, it's young men that, that who are most affected? Yeah, I mean, I would say disproportionately. Obviously, this is affecting society as a whole. Obviously, there's lots of, of homeless uh, women who are also probably more likely to be victimized when on the streets. So it's um, it, it's really affecting everybody. I don't think there's anybody who's immune from it. It's it's poisoning neighborhoods. Uh, as far as victims of violent crime, it's probably uh, the random acts of violence. It's, there's been a lot of female victims quite prominently here in British Columbia. So uh, I really think it's affecting everybody. But of course, when it comes to, to, to the drug use, the opioid abuse, addiction, and the overdose deaths, uh, I think it's something like 70, 75% uh, male. Okay. And since this has been happening, like what has been put in place to help kind of decrease uh, the number of deaths that, that are occurring? Like what safe measures is the government trying to do to, to protect these people from dying? Well, what the government, I guess it depends on which government, but particularly the federal government right now and in BC, the province of British Columbia, this is not something that's going on in other provinces like Alberta, but they view it as uh, we're not in an, an addictions crisis um, or an opioid crisis, we're in a poison drug crisis. So it's not the fact that people are addicted to opioids, it's the fact that these opioids are uh, mixed with uh, other, uh, well, uh, you know, fentanyl or mi mixed with uh, uh, meth or, or trank or, or benzos or whatever the case may be, and it's leading to this spike in overdose deaths. And if we provide a clean source of drugs or make it easier to access what they call a clean source of drugs, that will dramatically reduce deaths. Now, that to me never added up. To begin with and when i started chatting with people and conducting interviews it became painfully clear that um there was a, some massive uh important facts that were being ignored for example uh, when i first started making the documentary i thought all of these individuals were addicted to heroin and less deadly opioids and that they were getting mixed in with fentanyl uh, once i started making the documentary it became quite clear that the vast majority of the addicts on the street were actually addicted to fentanyl and were seeking out fentanyl. And that was a huge, um, that was kind of one of the first revelations that, that, that really struck me, that, that the people on the streets were looking for the strong stuff. That's what they wanted. That was the high that they had become addicted to. And that was the high that they were pursuing. And when it came to mixing drugs, for example, speedballing where you mix fentanyl with crystal meth, um, you know, that wasn't happening by accident. These were addicts that were purposely seeking out that particular uh, combination and that particular high. So uh, immediately it became obvious to me that, that hand, handing out so-called uh, clean opioids uh, might not be as effective as they were hoping it was going to be. Uh, it also became uh, the next big revelation was, you know, these clean opioids that they were handing out were not being taken by the fentanyl addicts and instead were being turned around and sold or traded to the dealers for the fentanyl that they actually wanted. Um, and then these uh, opioids, hydromorphone, which is basically Oxycontin on steroids, were then being distributed to either college campuses, university campuses, um, people who were addicted to painkillers who might want to inje uh, inject uh, the hydromorphone directly for a, a faster and stronger high. So they were not being used as, as these government uh, health officials in Ottawa had, had imagined a scenario where they were going to hand out all these hydromorphone pills. Everyone who was addicted to fentanyl was going to stop using fentanyl. And then we were just going to have um, individuals addicted to hydromorphone, which would be a more manageable situation, a less deadly situation. That clearly has not been happening. Instead, we've just flooded the market with, with more incredibly dangerous drugs um, that have that have created another generation of addicts uh, while not uh, really helping the situation at all. And so with that being said, like what's been the mainstream media's coverage of all this compared to say what people are saying on the street or what the people in BC believe is going on? Well, I think what we have with the mainstream media is a, a, a combination of, of um, they're obviously beholden to a certain ideology. They're also... I mean, some people are lazy. Some of them are just under-resourced, in fairness to them. Um, but they're predisposed to just buy into and uncritically parrot the talking points of the left. And what the left does is when they're losing a debate, they'll just invent a new word. 
um, and rebrand whatever failed policy they were pursuing before. So with safe injection sites, which became very controversial uh, and for uh, for obvious reasons, uh, how they would you know open one in a neighborhood and it would just destroy that entire neighborhood, uh, they basically renamed them to overdose prevention sites. And left-wing left advocacy groups just started doing this in Vancouver, and the media just completely uncritically started calling them overdose prevention sites and basically never calls them safe injection sites anymore. Even though safe injection sites, I mean, I think is... It's just not exactly a right wing term. I mean, that's a term originally invented by the left. And I mean, they are injection sites. I think it's, even, it's obviously debatable whether they're safe. Um, but they just started calling them overdose prevention sites. And then that's that's now uh, how the media has tried to ingrain that into the minds of Canadians. Now, uh, the other place that's happened, I think, much more dangerously is with uh, terms around safe supply and the poison drug crisis. So that's how the media, those are the the pillars for which the media reports this crisis. So they say, uh, again, they just adopt talking points from left-wing activists uh, and language specifically. So they say there's a poison drug crisis. They say it over and over again, the Globe and Mail, CBC, CTV, there's a poison drug. That's the crisis we're in. It's not addiction, it's not opioid addiction. Um, it's a poison drug crisis. Now, if you buy in and you cement that narrative in the minds of the Canadian people, Obviously, if the problem is the poison drug crisis, the solution would be to have drugs that aren't poisoned or aren't, uh, uh, you know, that are clean. And then there is the introduction of safe supply. And uh, so that's what they were pursuing. Whereas I looked into it and this never added up to me to begin with, because, you know, at the same time, we have so much uh, cultural material, whether from the news or Hollywood or whatever, from the United States about Purdue and um, everything that happened with Oxycontin and, you know, the Sackler family and how they and, sell and the Sackler the, family. Uh, and when you're a lawsuit and you talk to Canadians, you talk to anybody. And it's it's pretty much, I would say, almost a cultural consensus that that was wrong. That was a huge mistake. And we killed thousands of people as a result. And someone needs to be held accountable. And yet those drugs, Oxycontin is what the government today would call safe supply. That is what they would call safe supply. And that is what we are handing out on mass, except what we're handing out on mass is actually stronger, uh, more deadly and more addictive. So it's, it's um, it, to me, it was, it, that never added up. And uh, I mean, the government of BC is literally handing out hydromorphone, uh, Dilaudid, uh, which was made by Purdue, and uh, which is stronger than Oxycontin, while at the same time suing Purdue for the the consequences of the start, starting the opioid crisis in the first place, so they're literally suing Same. Purdue for doing something ten years ago that they are currently doing today, except worse. Wow, uh, yeah. When you put it like that, it really becomes obvious that you know there's something to be you know at least looked into here. And when you have looked into the numbers, Aaron, what have they shown? Have they shown that when safe supply has been uh, available, that uh, more people are dying? Yeah, I mean, I'd, I mean, you know, sometimes it's, there's complex problems, but there's also pretty straightforward data points. I mean, British Columbia has been at the vanguard around the world at pursuing these easy access to drugs, uh, you know, so-called kind of the policies and ideology around harm reduction, what they would call harm reduction. And there's pretty much nowhere in the world where the problem's worse. So uh, it hasn't been getting better. It's continued getting worse. I don't even know. Um, you know, you have two thousand last couple of years, over two thousand people in British Columbia dying every year from from opioid overdoses. Makes you makes you ask have to ask the question like, how many people are addicted to these drugs in the province? Is it, you know, is it fifty thousand? Is it seventy thousand? This is a shocking number of people. Of course, they're also straining uh, police resources, uh, paramedic resources, uh, hospital and healthcare resources. So it's um, an incredibly burden on 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 society. I know the wait times in Ontario have gone up considerably over the last few years. Is that the same in in uh, British Columbia as well? The wait times in the ER, I mean, is what I'm referring to. Yeah, and I mean that's I mean obviously the opioid crisis is is a big part of that. Uh, I mean COVID was a part of that. Some of the policies the government I think took in response to COVID was a part of that. And our <laughs> our healthcare system, which I just produced another documentary on, was as a part of that, just from a big picture. But I think that. Um, yeah, I mean, clearly what, what we're doing hasn't been working. That, that's how I look at it. That's really, I mean, as someone who lives here, it was just what we're doing is not working, and yet no one is 
suggesting we do something else and no one is even pointing out the fact that it's clearly not working and we're just all going along with this and, so and what is the solution to it if there is one or how can we at least mitigate it yeah i, th I think the first thing that you do is um basically what the government of british columbia is doing right now with the feds with ottawa is they're they're attempting I don't even think this is a mischaracter that they would openly acknowledging this is they're attempting to basically normalize hard drug use. Um, now, when I look at and and or the other word they use is destigmatize hard drug use. You know, I look at that as as enabling hard drug use. And the thing about stigma is stigma is a very effective um, lever in society to actually promote or discourage uh, certain behaviors or actions that have negative consequences for yourself, your family, taxpayers in the community. And I can't think of anything uh, more toxic with more negative side effects than becoming addicted to opioids. I mean, it's it's uh, a cruel and destructive uh, force to become beholden to. And yet that is what we're trying to destigmatize. And it's, it's so run so counter to every other public health campaign we've been running. Look at smoking cigarettes. Obviously, we've been running very strong campaigns against uh, smoking and the results are dramatic. Uh, drinking and driving, which was obviously commonplace back in the 50s and the 60s, very strong public health and advocacy and awareness and stigmatization campaigns. And the rates of drinking and driving have fallen you know, uh, off a cliff, they've fallen dramatically. And yet when it comes to you know, hard drug use and drug addiction that's killed more people, brought more social havoc uh, than any of these other problems, uh, we're doing the exact opposite. We're, you know, we're no longer, you know, in high schools running prevention campaigns. We're going to high schools and handing out safe snorting kits. We're going out to high schools saying that if you're using drugs to use with a friend. Um, I mean, this has changed so much from even when I was in high school. Uh, it's, a good, it's a good point, years you know, with, with regards to like the, the stigma, because it's also too, you know, we're in this like anti-shaming world as, as well. And like, I'm not saying that it's always good to shame people by any stretch of the imagination, but you know, there's a feeling why we do feel shame or why we do feel guilt and you feel shame or feel guilt so that you change your behavior so that you don't do that again. You know, and you know, guilt is a big one because, you know, if you don't feel guilt when you do something bad, that makes you a psychopath. You know, so like people should feel guilty. They should feel, you know, shame if they're doing something wrong. And I think that, uh, you know, you made a real good point there about the stigma. Like I've never really, you know, thought about that before. Like, you know, cigarettes are stigmatized, you know, and they're stigmatized at a very, very early age. I mean, it's taught in, you know, adolescent uh, classrooms that, you know, cigarettes are very, very bad for you. And there's, uh, you know, stigmatization is, is, I think, a big part of like why they were so uh, successful in doing that. Um, also too, one thing that I wanted to chat with you about today, Aaron was, you know, you, in your documentary, uh, you had some people you're interviewed with regards to repeat offenders. And it seems like there's, you know, uh, people in Canada who are repeating crimes over and over violent crimes and they keep getting released. And so can you go over a little bit of that, um, with us and, and why did you want to include that in your documentary? Well, I think uh, as first to why I included in the documentary, I mean, the, the thesis of the, democ uh, the documentary was simply that obviously Canada is dying, but, you know, when it came to our, our downtown courses, especially there was a certain amount of chaos that is beginning to grip them. And that's from a combination, I think, of this open air drug use, homelessness and, and rampant crime. Uh, and that's rampant, first of all, uh, petty crime where it's virtually impossible to go to jail now for for shoplifting or vandalism or breaking windows and and i was actually in london ontario and some business owner told me at, at a great line he said you know you get what you tolerate as a society if you tolerate people shooting up on the side of the streets you're going to get people shooting up on the side of the streets if you tolerate people uh you know walking into de uh, department stores or convenience stores and stealing 300 dollars worth of stuff and there's no consequences then you're going to get it and if you, if you tolerate broken windows, you're going to get it. Uh, if you, so it, if you tolerate people's cars getting broken into, you're going to get it. So uh, this, th these repeat kind of prolific offenders on the petty crime. And then also with, as you pointed out, the repeat violent criminals who continually getting out first on bail after the federal government passed a bail reform law. And then now just throughout the entire system. It is a system that, that uh, rewards 
um, or is a system that puts criminals ahead of victims. It's a system, and it's done that for a while, but it's a system now that's even putting the interests of criminals ahead of the interests of public safety. Uh, you saw that again in Ontario. Uh, they released a individual who was, I can't remember what he was, uh, was it manslaughter or something on bail? And the judge basically said, I'm pretty sure uh, there's a better than not chance you're not going to reoffend, so I'm going to release you. A couple of days later, he murdered a cop uh, at a traffic stop. So, um, you know, th this is putting public safety at kind of the back of the priority list. And there's, you can directly tie this to certain pieces of federal legislation, whether it's Bill um, I think it's C-21 or Bill C-5. And um, I think it's part of a deeper ideology, actually, where the people pushing these policies, kind of the, the, the ivory tower and, and our universities and in Ottawa, who believe that, you know, they don't really believe fundamentally in, in and you see this with the drug issue as well, actually. They don't fundamentally believe in the individual agency and individual responsibility. The idea that everybody is responsible for their own actions and is capable of being um, a law-abiding, productive citizen. And instead, if something goes wrong, if if you if you steal something from the store or uh, you know, break a window or you assault somebody or you run somebody over in your car or even if you murder somebody. Uh, that must be the result of a whole bunch of things that society has let you down on, uh, whether that is, uh, you know, wealth, income inequality or systemic racism or whatever the case. It's never that individual's uh, responsibility to kind of own up for it. So thus, it's actually us as society who should be paying the burden and the entire focus of the justice system should be not on deterrence, not on public safety, but on this the concept of rehabilitation at the expense of all other uh, considerations. And I think we've seen that now woven through the entire justice system. And I think we're basically, you know, reaping the whirlwind of those actions. Yeah, I, I think we definitely are reaping the whirlwind because I, you know, I, I remember in your in your documentary, uh, there was one guy who was 16 years old and he was killed and the guy only got eight years in jail, which, you know, to me, I don't think that's a fair punishment for you know, killing a 16 year old kid who had his whole life in front of him. And uh, just as you pointed out in the documentary, when you, you know, interviewed that mom, who was very brave to come on, like, you know, she said it was a slap in the face. I can't remember her exact words, but mm -hmm. you know, something like that. So, and we know that there's many, many more stories just like that out there in Canada now. And I do think we really need to, you know, clamp down on uh, repeat offenders and violent crimes because it shows that when you let them out, they do something again. Yeah, and he got eight years, and I think he was out in less than five. So it's which is crazy for murdering somebody, and that was that was I mean that was an interesting story because it had all of the different it was like stacked all the 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 different considerations in our justice system and the way that it failed. He had fifty prior uh, crimes, including stabbing multiple people, and yet he was on the on the streets. Uh, he was an individual that you know he served a couple years before the conviction in prison. Um, so you get time and a half. So that lowered a sentence again. Then you get automatic parole at two thirds of your sentence. So you're out two thirds of the way through there. Uh, then in that case, that individual was indigenous. So then you get something called a Gladue report and um, you usually get time taken off your sentence again. So it was all these, you know, the combination of factors that basically led to him stabbing somebody in broad daylight and serving essentially five years behind bars for it, which is crazy. And if he did that in somewhere like Texas or Florida, what would be the punishment? Oh, I mean, I'm sure he'd have, uh, I'm sure he'd have 25 to 25 to life or, or, I mean, I don't know the justice system there. I'll tell you, he won't be out in five years. That's for sure. Uh, yeah. So it was, um, it was, uh, I mean, it's just, it's it, again, and it's not just, it's a, it's a matter of justice and a matter of deterrence. Yes. But you know, this guy's back on the streets now. Like this is somebody who had stabbed people before and stabbed someone again and killed them, served five years and now he's back on the streets again. I mean, like what's the Vegas odds that he's that he doesn't commit another serious violent crime and there isn't another Canadian victim. And from my point of view, uh, when this individual almost inevitably uh, attacks again, it's the government, it's the politicians that push these policies that have the blood on that innocent victim's hands because it, this is such a predictable uh, outcome of these events that um, I just think they're, you know, they're often they're kind of relatively safe, uh, safe neighborhoods. And, you know, it's usually 
uh, actually kind of the, the working the working class, the, the lower middle class, the middle class, they're the victims of most of these crimes. Well, I certainly hope that uh, Pierre Polyev does something about this. And uh, I certainly hope that we get the violent crime, you know, at least um, mitigated here in Canada, but hopefully we can lower it, you know, significantly because, um, you know, people are basically are feeling unsafe. And, you know, that was one thing that was very clear in your documentary is that, you know, people felt unsafe and not in just like, you know, places that you would think that uh, that may have, you know, a track record of being a little bit unsafe, but places like Nynamo. Um, you know, there was uh, a few women on your, on your documentary who said that, you know, they don't feel safe in their neighborhood. So it's not just, you know, uh, a neighborhood problem. It does seem to be, you know, a Canada wide kind of issue. Um, that being said, so I know you have uh, another documentary, uh, Waiting to Die. Uh, that's your, your, your newer one. Um, so what kind of propelled you to, to uh, make this documentary? Uh, well, when I choose the topics for the documentary, I think one of the, the probably the biggest issues that I look at are, uh, or kind of like a Venn diagram of what are the really important issues in Canada that affect a lot of people that no one is talking about or no one is talking or telling the other side of the story or, or really doing the proper investigative journalism. And I think healthcare and our healthcare system is right at the top of that list because uh, it's always at the top of concern, uh, top of mind uh, for Canadians. And we've seen over the past 10 years, especially uh, wait times getting worse. I think the quality of care uh, getting worse. And yet we're spending more and more money every single year. And again, it goes back just like Canada's dying. Something's not adding up there. We're dumping money at the system. Uh, almost no politician in this country um, is willing to talk about serious health care reform. The solution is just about spending more money, essentially. That may be beginning to change. but um, And that doesn't make sense. It didn't add up. And if anyone suggests uh, uh, you know, bringing in changes to the system, you immediately get get accused of trying to bring in US style healthcare. And you know, I knew before this that there's 28 universal healthcare systems in the world in developed countries. And I wanted to find out what they were doing and if there's something that we could learn and how they were performing and how Canada was stacking up against them. So that's why I decided to to really investigate it and, and dig a little bit deeper. And um, you know, there's there's nothing I like going after more than than sacred cows and and just you know the issues uh, you know you know there's Democracy, I think, you need to have an informed. Your democracy is only as strong as your citizens are informed, and that applies to individual issues specifically. And whether it's with the opioid crisis or this violent crime wave or um, the healthcare crisis, I think a lot of the media has abdicated the responsibility of, of talking about these 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 serious issues and investigating them properly, and at least presenting different perspectives to allow Canadians to decide. So healthcare, I just thought was another one of those topics. And, you know, I also saw with my own uh, uh, two eyes again, a couple years ago, a uh, father had a heart attack, was in the hospital, and just like the, the hallway care that was going on, the, the chaos, the labor shortage, and it was so confusing because it's, it's not that we don't have enough money. I mean, this is an incredibly wealthy country, a country that would actually also be wealthier if it was managed a bit better. But even as it is, it's an incredibly wealthy country. And when you have the health care outcomes that we have today, like people waiting a year to get knee surgery or uh, medicine being practiced in the hallways of our hospitals or, you know, nurses so being family doctor shortage is a big one. Six million Canadians without a family doctor. Um, the ones that, that do have a family doctor can never get in to see them either. So can never get in. You know, and specialists are even worse and especially certain specialties. Yeah, like it can be like literally years. Uh, it mm -hmm. is often years when I when I uh, make a referral, you know, mm -hmm. for dermatology or even like neurology. And it can be something, you know, fairly serious and fairly debilitating to, to someone, you know, like I have someone who had severe vertigo uh, recently and, you know, it really does affect this person's life. And it's going to take over a year for this person just to see a neurologist. And so, and I think I did a urology uh, referral recently and it was like two to three years. And this is very, very common. It's been going on for a while and it doesn't really seem like there's anything being like done about it. And I had a, a gentleman, Dr. Matt Strauss on my podcast um, j just yesterday actually. And, you know, he's a critical care uh, doc. And he said that um, when he uh, got out from, from, from a school, from, from residency or from his fellowship, there was two spots available in all of Canada and there was five of them training at Western. So obviously, you know, there's not enough 
positions available, yet the government is training these people to do this job that they do, that they can't even give them a job for. So I think, you know, there has to be, you know, a big kind of top bottom down, uh, you know, change in, you know, how we uh, give jobs out to the physicians that we're training. And I think we need to make sure that we have enough physicians each year that go into family medicine and that go into emergency medicine, just because, you know, those are, you know, the ones where people are on the front line. And if you don't have those, then, you know, healthcare kind of, you know, really goes uh, down quickly. Yeah. And I think it's, um, uh, I mean, all those points are super important. I just think that when you look again at how wealthy this country is and how much of a priority healthcare is, it comes down to a resourcing issue that we're not resourcing effectively the central, centrally managed bureaucracy. Um, uh, maybe unsurprisingly from my perspective is, is, is not efficient at allocating these resources. And, um, and we need to look at other systems, other options of, of way to organize and deliver this, these services. So uh, to, to me, it's all, and to me, it's always been kind of obvious because, uh, you know, monopolies, whether they're, they're private sector monopolies or whether they're government monopolies, tend to be very unresponsive to, to market demands. There tends to be, uh, you know, shortages. You tend to end up having to ration goods or services. And in healthcare, if there's a word that defines what we're doing, it's rationing care. And um, so, I mean, I think we need to look at every other sector of the economy which doesn't have these issues or has them in much, in much less of a uh, uh, debilitating way. And try to to integrate those forces, whether they're whether it's competition or private sector invi invi uh, involvement, while also ensuring that everybody gets the care that they need. And when you were making this documentary, what was the most surprising finding that you found? Like, what did you find that you kind of weren't really um, thinking you were going to find when you were going to make the documentary? The definitely the um, so like the the federally enforced. Uh, kind of moratorium on being able to uh, invest in your own health, so to to pay to receive health care. Um, different provinces, I know, have started trying to do different things, but the federal government just recently basically uh, fined Alberta and Saskatchewan for allowing people to pay for MRIs, um, which doesn't make it's confusing on a couple of different levels because I don't know what the federal government is not really supposed to have a role in health care. It's supposed to be a, the delivery of health care is supposed to be a provincial responsibility. So they're basically just trying to, to, I don't know, blackmail or, or um, uh, blackmail ex extort various provinces that would rather try to experiment with different different approaches. But the biggest, one of the biggest surprises to me is just how many workarounds there were for that. So you know, uh, the notional uh, rationale against being able to invest in your own healthcare. Um, regardless of how badly you need it, is that, you know, as Canadians, we're all supposed to wait in line. We're all supposed to be in the same queue and it's kind of first come, first serve and nobody gets special treatment. And, um, you know, obviously we're triaging people based on condition, but, but beyond that, there's not, you know, special treatment for certain individuals. But it's so bizarre because we're fighting all of these efforts at reform uh, from other systems that have way better outcomes than us based on that principle. And yet that principle doesn't even hold under our current system. Uh, you know, if you have the money and you have the resources and you need a procedure, number one, you probably can just leave the country. You can just go down to the United States and get it done. Number two, this is what shocked me the most, is for knee and hip replacements, uh, you can't actually get them done in your own province. You can't pay for them in your own province, but you can go to a different province. So in BC, we've got BC residents going to Alberta to get procedures and we have Alberta residents coming to BC to get these uh, procedures done. So it's legal for someone from BC to go to Alberta and to pay someone to get a knee procedure, but it's not legal for someone in BC to get a knee procedure done in BC. Correct. Correct. So you'd like, as a doctor, I think it's, you can't bill someone who's currently covered under in BC, we call it MSP, the medical services plan. Um, for a service that's covered it. But if it's an Albertan, they're not covered by MSP. They're not enrolled in the healthcare system in BC. So you can, you can actually perform that procedure. So, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's insane. You can have uh, uh, people here, here from the United States that fall ill or get injured, can get procedures and pay for healthcare in Canada, but Canadians can't. And it's, um, so to me, that's what made, uh, is very, is it was really the eye-opening thing, especially the, the cross, uh, province travel um, from people looking to get these procedures and I think look I understand why people 
like this idea of everybody being treated the same. But to, to me, it's not about we can't be driven by ideology. We have to be driven about what has the best outcomes for the most people. And there's no evidence to suggest that if people are investing their own resources in the healthcare system, taking themselves outside of the public queue to receive that private treatment, that anyone else in the public queue is left any worse off than they are before. In fact, usually they're better off because you've now increased the capacity of the healthcare system. And it's, it's um, so I think that was, that, that was a big uh, revelation. Actually, I, I totally blew by. For sure, the biggest revelation was when I was visiting Windsor, Ontario. Um, there's a new report that came out that shows 2, 000, nearly 2,000 nurses uh, every week commute to the United States to work. Uh, so, so we have a you know healthcare shortage, labor shortage, a healthcare crisis in Canada. Meanwhile, we have almost 2,000 nurses, obviously mainly in a handful of border cities, that commute to the United States uh, to work. And the biggest one is in Windsor, where they're commuting down to Detroit. So they we interviewed that because they get better pay. Uh, I interviewed them. They said there is better pay. There's more incentives, but the number one thing was working conditions. There's the working conditions. They said are infinitely better. Um, and the, the like two specifically, like why the working conditions are better there? Uh, well, I think they identified it to the, the management of the hospitals, kind of the bureaucracy, and then even more specifically, the union. So there's uh, most of those hospitals are not unionized down there. And it allowed for, as they basically pointed out, uh, much group, if you're if you're a high performing nurse, if you're someone who wants to take different courses and, and kind of move up the ladder and take on more things, you're allowed way more freedom. Whereas they were explaining in, in Canada was kind of, this is how it's done. Um, this is how you have to do it. This person has to do X, you have to do Y. This person has more seniority, that kind of thing of how things were, were structured. And it basically stifled any amount of, of, of innovation. So they have, basically they have more autonomy. They have a better you know, working environment, and they're probably getting more money per hour. And of course, the American dollar is worth much more than the Canadian dollar. So, you know, their dollar goes a lot further. So I understand now why they're doing it. But it is a shame because we do need those nurses. I mean, 2000 nurses, that's a lot of nurses, I can't tell you how many hospitals that would that would cover, but it is pretty significant. Yeah. And, and the other big thing they brought up was flexibility. And I mean, it's it's um, the amazing thing, again, as one of the speakers I interviewed pointed this out. You know, this this shouldn't be and I think we see polls changing on this because this shouldn't be shocking to most Canadians, because most Canadians actually have a pretty good understanding of, you know, the private sector uh, usually delivering much better service than the public sector, the government. Uh, everyone knows people that you know, understand what it's like to work for the government versus working for the private sector. I mean, where can you be more efficient? Where can you deploy resources uh, most effectively? Um, what is the what is the sector that embraces and deploys innovation, entrepreneurialism, and reform uh, to the greatest benefit of society? And I don't know why we think healthcare is any different than that. In many ways, healthcare, uh, especially you know, is, is technology plays a huge role in healthcare. They also talked about how the American system was quite a bit more uh, technological. They were much faster to adopt technology than we were here. They were much more nimble, which again, private sector versus the government. And they just, uh, the nurses we talked to basically said, look, if you if you had an idea as a nurse and you brought it up to management, you said, hey, I think this would actually like, you know, save some time and allow us to treat more patients or allow to treat them more effectively, they would be open to that suggestion and they would entertain it and they would usually try it and if it worked out better they'd go with it whereas in canada um they would say they say no this is not how we, that's not how we do things you guys just got to interject there because uh again dr matt strauss who's on the the podcast you know he said that when he was working in a hospital somewhere uh he was looking for a report and i guess they were using a fax machine instead of just sending it uh to to his computer via email and so because uh he wasn't able to get the, the report the person was there for three to four more days you know costing the healthcare system another six to eight thousand dollars he said it's roughly you know about two thousand dollars a day so you know if they just updated that technology from a fax to a computer email, you know, they may have been able to save six to $8,000, which is an insane amount of money. So, you know, I understand, you know, coming back to your earlier point about it's insane how rich of a country we are and how much money we're putting into healthcare, but we're just not getting the output that we're putting in, you know? So, um, and just another example of where we could be saving money and, 
that would that would be an easy save just through using technology a little bit better. Yeah, I think one of the nurses had an example where I think they said a couple of years ago Windsor brought in um, you know patients' files being all electronic, so they can they can access them one of the hospitals there. And she said that the hospital in Detroit that they were working with has been doing it since like 2006. So it's it's um, I just think it's and look the Americans obviously we interviewed them because of the nurse 2,000 nurses going to work for the United States, but um, you know the Americans have a non-universal system uh, by design. Uh, Canadians from a um, it's obviously more complicated than how it's portrayed in the media much of the time, but it's a non-universal system by design. Uh, Canadians, you know, universal health care is part of our identity and it's part of what the vast majority of Canadians want to see. But those aren't the two options. I mean, if you go to Europe, every single country has a universal health care system and every single country has uh, massive amounts of private sector involvement in delivering that health care uh, to much greater outcomes than we have, whether it's the UK or Sweden, which have similar systems to ours, plus private sector involvement or other systems that I would say actually get the highest performance, like Switzerland or Germany or the Netherlands. Um, which have other ways of, of delivering healthcare through kind of a universal insurance scheme um, that uh, has much better outcomes. Is a two-tier system from your research the best way to go? Or who would be, I guess, the best country to model after is probably a better, a better question if we were to kind of reform healthcare here in Canada. Well, I think Sweden and the UK probably have the, and Australia probably have, like they have systems that were, that, like they had our system 40 years ago and then they changed it. Uh, in the case of Sweden in the 90s, I think in the case of the UK a bit earlier. Uh, Germany, um, Switzerland, Netherlands, I would probably say have the highest performing healthcare systems. They're more like, they seem to be more like the Americans, but with basically, if you can't afford insurance, the government will pay, will buy it for you. Um, but in all cases, there is a very robust uh, private sector. In, this, in Sweden, they have something, uh, basically of the public system that you can use. And within 90 days, if you can't get treatment, if you can't get uh, your knee replacement, if you can't get uh, a referral to a specialist, then you can go anywhere, whether it's a private clinic or outside of your uh, province or um, I can't remember what they call them there, but like little regions, healthcare region, uh, and the government will pay for it. So you got 90 days to kind of get it locally and then you can go anywhere. And then what that creates is... Where is this again? The this is Sweden. Sweden. That's in Sweden. And, and the other thing is they use uh, activity-based uh, funding versus uh, primarily rather than global budgeting. So here a lot of hospitals just get big budgets. Uh, there in Sweden, you know, the hospitals are getting paid based on the services and the procedures that they perform. So they're incentivized to actually see patients and to become more efficient and to attract patients. So you've got, you know, hospitals saying, oh, you should, you know, we've got the best uh, uh, knee replacements, you should come visit us because they want that money from the government. And just like every other, I mean, some people think competition is a bad thing, which I find bizarre because in every other sector of the economy. It would speed things up, obviously. Yeah, and you compete on speed and you also, you also compete on quality. Like people are uh, in the internet age, you're not gonna, you're not gonna get, a, obviously you're gonna heavily regulate the healthcare sector, but also, um, you know, you're going to drive uh, just like any sector of the economy, uh, you know, from from restaurants to, to, to whatever the case may be. I mean, you're going to compete on on price and, and uh, on quality and um, service. So it's um, it's a much different experience. But I think it's it's uh, in Canada. It's just it's so obvious that the, the healthcare bureaucracy and the and the unions have just stifled a lot of innovation and. Um, and the ability to actually, uh, uh, and, and the big thing too is, is this kind of the fallacy push that, uh, you know, we're in this, we're living within like a fixed pie. Like there's only a fixed amount of healthcare resources in this country. So we want to divide it as equally, as equitably as possible. But, you know, that's no more true in healthcare than any other sector of the economy. It's not a fixed pie. If we, if we uh, have a more robust system, if we deliver that service more efficiently, if we have private individuals investing some of their own funds into the system, we'll increase that pie, we'll increase the healthcare capacity for Canada as a whole and allow more Canadians to receive timely access to care. Because I mean, right now we have a universal wait time system, basically, where everyone's, everyone's got access to uh, long wait times. 
I mean, the, the 90 day thing is, is a very important point there because, you know, we were talking about the opioid crisis earlier. So say if you're in a ton of pain and you're waiting to get a knee replacement and you get that knee replacement early, well, then maybe, you know, you don't need opioids. Maybe you need them for a very short time, but you don't need them very long because you get your knee replacement soon, you know, within a month or two, whatever the, the time frame is. But say, you know, you have real bad knee pain and you're told in Canada that your surgery is not going to be till 2026, which is completely realistic, but also ridiculous. But that is, you know, uh, reality in Canada right now. Well, that person has to live in pain then for three years. So, you know, there's a huge opportunity for that person then to get addicted to opioids, right? If you're taking opioids for three years, you know, coming off them is going to be very, very tricky, right? But if you're taking them just for one or two months, you know, it's going to be easier then to come off. So I think that, you know, by increasing the availability of the healthcare, we can actually also contribute by uh, to, to decreasing the, the opioid crisis that's going on. But to your point earlier too, you know, it is kind of strange how Canadians are so reluctant to, you know, reform healthcare or to want to change their stance on, on healthcare. But I think that, I hope anyway, that that's changing now, just because if it's getting so bad, like how bad do wait times have to get before someone says, okay, maybe we should look at doing something different. Or, you know, with the, if the knee replacement goes from three years to six years, I mean, people are going to, I think, get fed up eventually. So, you know, have you seen, Aaron, any kind of change in, in how Canadians are viewing healthcare? And do you think that more and more Canadians are open to a two-tier system now more than ever? Yeah, and and again, just to reiterate, because you know that two-tier system. I mean, it reminds me of the debates from the early 2000s. I mean, we already have a multi-tier. We already have a two-tier system. If you have money, you just cross the border and get service. Is is basically how the system currently works. And um, <laughs> again, I should also point out that uh, you know if you're if you're operating under the fallacy of this fixed pie, I guess that's a good thing for you because you know. Uh, these patients are leaving the country, but uh, really, that's money that could have been invested in our healthcare system right here in Canada. And yeah, and point. you look at you saw during COVID uh, quite different results in in some of these European countries and in the United States. But you know, the United States had significantly more health capacity uh, than we did here in Canada. Their hospitals had more capacity. They had more staff capacity. They had more ventilators and all sorts of other pieces of, of technology from from a per capita basis. Um, but um, have I seen results of uh, public opinion starting to shift big time? I, I know 20 years ago it was very it was very uh, divisive. Um, what what happens in Canada politically? I find is there's these big political debates. I believe the political debate around private health care was when Stockwell Day was leader of the Alliance, so that would have been the early 2000s and um, or maybe the late 90s and. The that policy position was effectively um, terrorized. I don't know what word you want to use, or it was be, it became politically unassailable. And then what happened? And that's I feel like the worst thing that happens in Canada because then everybody stops talking about it. And then we haven't had that debate for 20 years. But now, if you look at the polls, the demographics have changed. The healthcare system has deteriorated. Wait times have gotten a lot worse. And you have over 50 percent of Canadians now that are that support. And are open to more private sector involvement in healthcare. And I believe that number reaches 75% in the province of Quebec, which has been the most proactive at exploring some of these reforms. They've announced plans to open two private mini hospitals. They've got private clinics that have spread up across the country, one of which I toured in Quebec City. Uh, so it's, um, and for the most part, that, and just to clarify on Sweden too, you know, the big thing I think that we want uh, in Canada. Um, for, for especially for non-elective surgery is, is you know publicly funded private delivery of care so that's i think where there's there's the biggest consensus in canada where there's the most obvious path forward is starting to you know you're still going to have publicly funded you're not paying out of your pocket for health care but we're going to allow the power of entrepreneurialism and competition and capitalism to deliver these services uh more efficiently and more effectively so I think that's where there's a huge opening. I mean, you see Doug Ford talking about it in uh, Ontario. Yeah. Um, I think the people paying for treatment will be a will be maybe less uh, uh, less forthcoming. But um, I mean, even in Sweden, about uh, you've got the publicly funded, publicly run 
tier, and then you have the publicly funded, privately run tier. And then you've got a small lane that only is about four or five percent of the population that's privately funded, privately run, where people are paying out of pocket. So, and, and in Sweden, uh, the public versus private, like what what is that split roughly? Like, is it more public or more private? Well, so ninety five percent of the system is is um, publicly financed, and then it's just how those are how it's delivered. So, like, uh, I, I don't know what the breakdown is, maybe. Maybe two thirds are public and uh, publicly delivered. One third is privately delivered. But what everybody we talk to there is it actually, you know, it forced the public hospitals to be better as well because they effectively had to compete against the private hospitals for patients um, and to get their costs down. And the private hospitals, because the government's paying for them, um, costed the government about on average 30% less. Uh, to receive the healthcare, so it actually it lowered wait times and actually ended up saving taxpayers money. Um, so it was uh, it was quite efficient that way. And like I said, there's lots of different systems in Europe, but what's what's clear is that our system is at the bottom and and not performing, especially on wait times. One thing that I want to quickly chat with you about, and I feel like it ties into both your doc your your recent documentaries anyway, is you know there's um, a bit of a low income mental health crisis in in canada that i think a lot of physicians are are starting to see that and what i mean by that is that a lot of people that are in uh low income brackets are in fact uh you know struggling with mental health and struggling with substance abuse and addiction more and more and so you know what is there that we can do to kind of help uh these people that are in low income areas to potentially you know not get addicted to drugs or not um, you know, set themselves up for, for mental health um, uh, disorders later on in life. Yeah, I mean, I think the big thing is is to not normalize drug use, because if you normalize it, you enable it, you make it easier, you make access to drugs easier, you make open air drug use, which you don't see in Europe, um, you know, commonplace, uh, you're going to get more of it. And that's what we've been seeing. And I think instead what you need to be doing, and I, it's shocking to me that we've gotten away from this, as you know, like it's like we've completely forgot about prevention and and uh, talking to people and explaining to people how uh, deadly and destructive these these drugs are and creating a social stigma around them. And again, it's creating a social stigma. I mean, you mentioned smoking earlier, uh, which obviously has negative health outcomes, but I would argue how outcomes that pale in comparison to what the opioid crisis is doing in the sense that the opioid crisis, how it tears families apart, how it increases crime how it drives all sorts of violence and abuse and kind of just societal chaos, stress on the healthcare system, stress on taxpayers, stress on police, stress on paramedics. And, um, you know, that, uh, you know, a kind of behavior that creates all of those side effects uh, should be stigmatized, should be discouraged, um, should be looked down upon as society. And not just for the benefit of, of us or for com your communities, but for the benefit of yourself, for the benefit of, uh, the people around you, uh, a lot of these people on the streets, you know, their their sons and daughters. There's also lots of mothers and fathers there. Very sad stories, and you know, the rippling, cascading effect of of this addiction crisis that we've helped perpetuate. I think will probably echo for many generations to come. But I think we just have to stop. I mean, right now, to me, when I see that the handing out of of these free drugs at these opioid clinics that have sprouted up across the country, I mean, it's it's really like trying to you know, put out a, uh, a fire by pouring gasoline on it. Like it's, it's, um, it's, it's not making it any better. It's, it's making it worse. And would you say that right now in, in BC, that's one of the biggest uh, things that people are most concerned with is the opioid crisis and with cleaning up the streets? Yeah, I think especially, unfortunately, uh, voters, generally speaking, uh, it really has to start affecting them for the, to really get up on their priority list. So, I mean, for a couple of years now, we've been having, a lot of overdose deaths that people have paid lip service to, but but not really presented strong solutions for. But what's really happened in the past four or five years is the street chaos that's exploded, the, 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 the homelessness mixed with the drugs, mixed with the revolving door justice system that's led to this explosion in violent crime, the explosion of these tent cities that have sprouted up, not just in Vancouver, but in small cities uh, uh, as well. Are, you're in, uh, are you in London or what's, what I'm city are you? Yeah, I'm in London, Ontario. So we were in London. I mean, London's gotten a lot worse from everyone we talked much, to. Much worse. Yeah, much worse. And I'm people see it. Through our cops. 
and you know they tell me stories you know all the time and uh, we're actually short of police officers here as well which is you know another issue um i imagine that's an issue across the country but it's a big issue here in london ontario yeah well i don't know who would want to be a police over a police officer nowadays and it's um yeah and, and you know, the other thing that that i've been thinking more about lately is it's just like collectively as society it's, it reminds me of we're basically being bad parents like this whole normalizing hard drug use destigmatizing it saying you know it's okay um, it reminds me of those really bad parents that would just let their kids get away with anything and you know you're not being your 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 child's friend by doing that you're actually doing them a huge disservice you're enabling. and you're enabling very bad destructive behavior that's going to have very uh, debilitating consequences for them as a result later in life, if not deadly consequences. And I think we're basically we're, we're basically doing that as collectively as a society right now by by normalizing this, and it's it's terrible. And it's the, the number one feedback that I got that I knew I was onto something is I have received overwhelming amounts of emails, comments. If you just look at the video from people who used to be addicted to these drugs, who used to be on the streets, who say literally without exception that if when they were on the streets these policies existed where the government was just, you know, handing out free drugs and free keys to a hotel room or whatever. They would either still be homeless and addicted to these drugs or they would be dead. And I heard that over and over again. And um, the path to recovery uh, is not easy, which is why we should focus also on prevention, obviously. Yep. But um, recovery is possible. That's the idea that, I mean, there's like uh, tens of thousands of people that have been addicted to to, to opioids that have, that have recovered from opioid addiction and um, and also the you know, one of the other things I, I learned when um, making this documentary is that it's actually easier to to withdraw from and overcome opioid addiction than it is alcohol addiction um, which is you know we're, we're making this into society like you know people can't overcome uh, this this opioid addiction, so we just have to give them free drugs. Uh, it's hydromorphone trying to mitigate the problem. Uh, I don't know, people can. There's hundreds of people every uh, I don't know every day or what the rate is every month that are that are getting clean, uh, getting off these drugs and turning their life around and becoming incredibly productive members of society again. I interviewed Chief of Staff to Alberta Premier Daniel Smith, who lived was homeless on the streets of Vancouver for four years. It does happen. Yeah, people do recover. You know, it's good for people to hear that because people do recover. I do see that in my office and in my practice. Yeah, and it's about the power also. It's about, it's that optimistic belief of individual agency uh, where, uh, you know, people have it within themselves to recover. And it's not an easy journey. And uh, certainly we need to be more supportive. And there's ways of building these communities and the, the community of, of, of recovery. But uh, everyone has it within themselves to recover, and we should be facilitating that and encouraging that uh, as governments, uh, as a country, I think, and cheerleading that rather than, um, you know, saying it's not possible or just handing out free drugs. I think it's going in the complete opposite direction, and um, it's it's sending the wrong message to, to all of these people that, that there is no hope, and this is, this is their lot in life, and they're just always going to be in the situation let's try to sweep them under the rug as much as possible i think that's a very depressing anti-human anti-hope message aaron uh i think that's a great way to, to leave it you know we do need more and more people standing up like you so thank you so much for chatting with me today but thank you so much for uh the documentaries that you've done please tell people where they can watch your your documentaries where they can find you on twitter and include your twitter handle and anything else that you want to include yeah, so the easiest way is, is uh, YouTube is where you can catch all, all my documentaries. You can also follow me on, on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And if you just type in Aaron Gunn, uh, you, can, you can find uh, find me on all those different platforms. Aaron, thank you so much for doing this today. I had a really great time chatting with you. And I think you, you know, brought a, really, uh, a lot of great subjects to light here today for people uh, that they really need to hear about. And thank you so much, everyone, for listening. And as always, I'll be back again next week.